PhD uh, group uh, because they are not only taking care of the mothers, but the future generation as well. Now, this session is about management. So for the first half management of pre-GDM will be taken by me and my good friend, Dr. Abhichandani will take the second half of management in GDM. So just to go back to the basics here, hyperglycemia in pregnancy could be pre-existing diabetes or it could be gestational diabetes. Pre-existing diabetes can be seen in women with type 1 diabetes or 2 type 2 diabetes, or they may be also having pre-GDM in the previous pregnancy and have then become uh, diabetic in their second pregnancy, just towards the second pregnancy. And they could be on OHA, insulin, or on the treatment that is given to uh, in classical treatment in diabetes. And gestational diabetes is a true diabetes or the classical diabetes, which happens in the 24 to 28 weeks of pregnancy. But it is a dysglycemia at any time during pregnancy, which could be due to pre-existing diabetes and that dysglycemia could be seen in the first or the second trimester. Just to reiterate that in India, we are seeing dysglycemia in a non-diabetic patient in the first trimester itself. And this has also been shown by Dipsy. To go forward, I'll take these two cases. I'll just give you the history of a 34-year-old obese lady with type 2 diabetes. She presents for follow-up visit. Her blood sugar has been well controlled on metformin. She wants to have a baby now and wants to know if there's any special thing to do that her diabetes will not affect her pregnancy. So what should we advise her and what about her anti-diabetic medications? So you see, first of all, this is a 34-year-old and she is becoming, uh, she wants to get pregnant, which goes to show that now the age of diabetes is coming down, that is younger and younger people are getting diabetes and the age of gestation is going up. So, you know, uh, women used to get pregnant at 19, 20, below the age of 25. And now they're having their first pregnancy after the age of 30 and maybe even 40. So this is clashing. And so the, we need to have pre-pregnancy planning for these women. Let's see how we advise her. We will see subsequently here. There's another um, lady, 26 years of age, known to have type 1 diabetes for the past 13 years. And she comes for pre-pregnancy guidance. What relevant history would you like to elicit and how should we counsel her? Let's see, we'll start from here. First of all, why do we require pre-pregnancy planning? It's a good thing that both these women came to us for consultation. This is not the scenario in the, in, in the OPD practice. Only 10% of women come for pre-pregnancy planning. The rest of them actually come after they get pregnant. And you will see the data here globally, 26% of the pregnancies are unplanned. And in India, 90% of the pregnancies are accidental. So we need to advise them when they come in the diabetic stage itself. As soon as you see a young girl who is in the reproductive age, which could be anywhere between menarche towards menopause, then we have to ask whether they are likely to get pregnant in the future. And therefore, they should take pre-pregnancy planning for pregnancy. They might come to use for obesity and they come to us for PCOS. At this stage only, we should alert them. So... The relationship between hyperglycemia and pregnancy and adverse perinatal outcomes is known to everyone. Early in pregnancy, there's a risk of miscarriage. There's a greater likelihood of the fetus having congenital malformations. And later in pregnancy, they might get preeclampsia, preterm induction of labor, cesarean section, and delivery complications. So I won't elaborate on all of those. And baby is born to type 1 diabetic mothers have a significantly higher rate of being large for gestational age. Uh, macrosomia, which is a birth weight more than 400, uh, and neonatal hypoglycemia. So pre-pregnancy planning is required. And therefore, we need to optimize the glycemic control before conception, all through conception, and then postpartum to reduce all this, these risks. So when the woman comes in front, we have to offer information. 
because they may not even know what the risks are and how much should be their target control of glycemia. You just heard a whole talk on exercise. What about the weight? We need to offer them the care that they require and advise them that they need to plan to become pregnant. And they should start from adolescent and ongoing at every visit. We need to optimize their glycemic control the day they come and meet you, as in these two patients. So the initial discussion should be on the role of diet. And diet, as we know, is medical nutrition therapy. Since I'm discussing pre-GDM, hopefully I think all the patients know about diet, but then you have to also reinforce and, and recall their diet to see whether they are on the right path. And if they are uncontrolled, I'm sure, I mean, you can see our Indian patient making, you tell them, you know, please stop sugar, jaggery. No, but someone, my neighbor told me that jaggery can be eaten. <laughs> you know, they all know that they should not, but still they say. So you have to reinforce that diet. And once they become pregnant, it is, it's like treating a type one patients. You need to split the meals so that the mother doesn't become hypoglycemic. At the same time, you can give uh, multiple doses of insulin to uh, for their uh, rising sugars. Body weight uh, correction is essential prior to pregnancy. Pregnancy is not the time to reduce weight. And therefore, if the person, if the woman does not is not close to the ideal body weight, which uh, you will see that they are not. Because, because you see, ours is the largest childhood obesity in the world, and all our women who are getting pregnant are all overweight. So we have to emphasize the need of weight reduction and exercise and diet to achieve a BMI of less than 25, if possible, or, or close to that. Review all the medications. Uh, so, you know, you it's not only diabetic medications, um, OHAs and insulin, but also the other medication. They may be taking thyroid medication. They might also be taking anti-psychological medication, which most of the youngers, youngsters are taking now. Also review whether they are smokers, whether they are on narcotic use. So we need to, act and too much of alcohol. So we need to actually tell them that this could be bad for their pregnancy. Look at the risks of hypoglycemia and hypoglycemia unawareness. This is especially applicable to type 1 patients because they are the ones who go into repeated hypoglycemia and therefore we have to see that their glycemic variability is not too high. Talk about nausea and vomiting that can happen in pregnancy and that can disturb their glycemic control and the risk of having large for gestational weight babies and also the likelihood of uh, birth trauma, induction of labor and cesarean section. Neonatal hypoglycemia can be a risk and therefore um, they need to feed the baby as early as possible. But I think the most important thing that we need to emphasize is the monitoring. Because I have seen in my many years of practice, not only in GDM and pre-GDM, but in general diabetic patients, that those who monitor their sugars are the ones who are best controlled. And if they have not been monitoring, we have to initiate this monitoring in the in the pre-gestational uh, planning period and explain to them that the monitoring will have to increase in frequency when they get pregnant. So this is the target blood sugar. Uh, it is uh, just like a non-pregnant state. So you see A1C less than seven, the ideal A1C they should be for to plan pregnancy should be less than 6.5. But we have to weigh the pros. We have to see whether they don't go into hypoglycemia, look at their co comorbidities, and also if they're older diabetics and also older in age, we have to uh, see the risks and benefit. But at all times, the A1C has to be below 7. Um, the, the greater the A1C uh, beyond 7, you see there's a steep uh, linear curve for congenital abnormalities. The pre-fasting um, plasma group should be between 80 to 130 and the PP should be less than 80. And of course, you need to have less stringent glycemic goals for um, individual patient appropriately. But um, if, once they get pregnant, of course, the goal of uh, target, target uh, blood sugar control is very, very stringent. So fasting 70 to 95. Dr. Abhichandani will tell you about this. 
But why I kept this slide is that nowadays we do CGMS and um, we need to also talk about glycemic variability, which is very important uh, since it increases the oxidant stress and that can be detrimental to the fetal. So those who are going for CGMS uh, before pregnancy, uh, if they are not, then we should insist as much as possible if the patient can afford that their TIR should be more than 70, TBR should be less than 4%, and the time above range should be less than 15% as much as possible in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And not only that, sometimes we need to modify the maternal factors and we have to target the individual factors, not only glycemia, but also the glycemic variability. And that's where the CGS CGMS comes in, we have to reduce the frequent excursions in blood glucose, look at the maternal obesity, losing weight before pregnancy is, is desired, a BMI less than 25, a gestational weight gain throughout pregnancy should be minimized. And uh, this is in line with the Institute of Medicine guidelines, Dr. Abhichandani will also tell you about this. And the maternal lipids, especially the maternal triglycerides, which rise when the sugars rise, these levels should be brought down by dietary manipulation. And you, you can see this uh, bar diagram here, the major congenital malformation, stillbirth, neonatal mortality, and perinatal mortality, all are high in um, in in pre-GDM women who get pregnant if their sugars are not controlled. But fortunately, with organized management and strict blood sugar control, a healthy pregnancy is achievable. And this, and also you can still have a healthy baby. Educate and obtain maximum cooperation from both the partners. I remember, say, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, you know, the lady used to come with the mother and mother-in-law. But nowadays, you see, it's always the husband and the wife who go for pre-pregnancy planning. Even in my other otherwise uh, diabetic practice, I always see husband and wife, which means, which is a good thing because both the partners are getting educated and they can help the mother to have a good pregnancy and a healthy baby. So optimize blood glucose to less than 6.5. Look for the thyroid function. The TSH has to be less than 2.5 in, in women who have hypothyroid. And PPA antibodies um, may be required, but of course, it is not going to change the line of treatment. However, if there are any abnormalities, we can, you know, kind of say your antibodies are also high at this time. But at all times, keep their thyroid function, T3, T4, and TSH in the range, in the target range. If they are hyperthyroid, um, I think we have to give minimum drugs um, to uh, minimum uh, medication to these patients and, and plan the pregnancy when, when the medication of hypothyroid is come to the minimum. Check for the immune status, especially the rubella. Uh, also encourage the other uh, team members, the, the obstetrician, diabetic educator, nutritionist, all of them should be on the same page. If the lady is on OHA, OADs, we have to switch them over to insulin if pregnancy is planned. Optimize the blood pressure. We often tend to neglect this. And of course, you have to stop the ACE and the ARBs. We can put them on better drugs, which are congenial for pregnancy. Methyl dopa, labetalol is the drug of choice. Amlodipine, nifedipine can be given. Stop the statins. And folic acid is advised three months prior to pregnancy. It is important to look for comorbidities. And amongst them, the PDR and NPDR, or the fundus examination is very, very vital. If they have an early PDR, it is better to do an intervention before they get pregnant because during pregnancy, you see the, the there is growth of these blood vessels in the retina that could uh, have a very rapid progression to PDR. And also with the expulsive uh, nature of delivery, these, this, these can rupture and give rise to retinal hemorrhages. At every stage in pregnancy, every trimester, this a fundal examination has to be done. Look also at the other comorbidities, whether they have gastroparesis, whether they have neuropathy, whether they have ischemic heart disease, 
Um, most women with pre-existing diabetes will need to be on basal bolus insulin protocol in pregnancy. That is the standard of care. A premix insulin can be given when it is con convenient, but it is not the ideal way to treat. It is best to give a basal bolus and sometimes you need to give an extra dose of insulin. But of course, you have to customize it to the patient. Insulin does not cross the placenta. It is safe, effective, and time-tested. It has to be individualized. All human insulin, regular insulin, NPH are safe in pregnancy. Insulin aspart and Lispro are approved in pregnancy, but there is insufficient data on glulysin. Detomir, which is a basal insulin, is, is approved by the FDA. Glargin is now to, found to be safe in pregnancy. Those who are already on glargin, you need not take this basal insulin off. You can continue the glargin also during pregnancy. But insulin deglodec has the data is not yet uh, there now for use in pregnancy. Both multiple dose insulin and the CGI pumps. The pumps are also reasonable delivery strategies, and but neither has been shown to be superior to the other during pregnancy. One must be aware when the pump is being used because there could be pump failure or tubal blockage or give rise to DKA. This is just one slide I wanted to add, potential contraindications to pregnancy because we are seeing the woman in the pre-gestational uh, period. So ischemic heart disease, heart failure, and, and um, heart um, cardiomyopathy, these can be contraindications. Active proliferative retinopathy, if it is untreated, or renal insufficiency, the creatine clearance is less than 50, or if there's a very heavy proteinuria or the blood pressure is too high despite treatment, uh, or severe gastropathy, because it can give rise to nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. It can just, you know, kind of take the patient out of the control and also give rise to a hypoglycemia that may not be detected. All these contraindications have to be kept in mind. So this is my last slide, a take-home message. You need to have optimal glycemic control preconception for better maternal fetal outcomes in patients with pre-GDM. There has to be preconception care and planning, which is integral for women with diabetes. Offer information, care, and advice to women uh, before they get pregnant, start from adolescent, continue throughout the reproductive life, advise con contraception if the HPA1C is more than 10 or even higher, or they need to postpone their pregnancy uh, for whatever reason, for other comorbidities, best is to advise contraception till it is necessary. We should also know when to stop it. Importance of glycemic management as low, as close to 6.5 is desirable. Contraindications to pregnancy, I already mentioned, folic acid three months prior to pregnancy, review all the medications, glycemic targets has, have to be reached, self-monitoring has to be enforced, and a structured diabetes education by a, a good team is essential to have a normal pregnancy and a normal delivery and a healthy baby. Thank you very much. And now I invite Dr. Abhichandani to take over. Yes, thank you very much, Madam, for that very lucid talk, fantastic coverage. You have done most of the job that I need to do. So thank you for that. And I would request you to stop sharing your screen so that I can start from my end. Yeah, okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, I will. Um, can I request the management people to allow me to share my screen? Uh, Yusuf, sir, uh, may I introduce uh, Abhichandani, sir? No wish, no wish, Dr. Niket. If you want me to, I'll do it. Yeah, yeah, please, please. So it's a, it's a privilege actually to have two very senior lucid speakers, Benny Ma'am and uh, Abhichandani, sir. So Dr. Vicky Abhichandani, uh, He's a diabetes and endocrine physician practicing since 1985 at Ahmedabad, principal investigator in various uh, clinical trials. Uh, he's uh, affiliated to ACE uh, and uh, the EASD. He's a life member of the RSSDI and a fellow uh, also uh, uh, for the uh, Indian Society of Hypertension. 
and the Research Trust of Diabetes India, guest speaker at various uh, regional, national and international conferences, uh, has been a regional faculty and he has authored uh, chapters on management of diabetes, uh, initiation of insulin, uh, stress-induced diabetes, and workup of a diabetic patient with suspected ischemic heart disease, and he has published many articles. So uh, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, invite uh, Dr. Vikki Abhichandani for the next talk. Thank you, Dr. Yusuf. Thanks a lot for all your kind words of introduction. And now I need to... Are my slides visible? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. So, very good afternoon, everyone, and thanks a million for allowing an old man in this youthful team. I mean, I have been also luckily a part of PSG since last three, four years. So I'm going to start where Madam ended very elegantly. So I'm going to cover the topic of gestational diabetes. GDM is defined as any degree of glucose intolerance with onset or first recognition during pregnancy. And GDM represents a stage of chronic beta cell dysfunction and is a milestone in the development of type 2 diabetes. And this the second line has been, uh, you know, uh, endorsed by Dipsy in year 2020-21. And I think it holds a lot of importance because that's why we see very malignant conversion rate of GDM ladies in a couple of years into the frank type 2 diabetes spectrum. And, uh, and as very correctly pointed out by Madam, uh, when we address GDM, we are going to uh, prevent two new generations of type 2 diabetes, the mother and the child to be born. So I'm going to uh, utilize three cases from my humble practice. I'll start with my first case. Uh, Mrs. RDP, a 28-year-old primary gravida woman from Ahmedabad. Her family history and personal history were unremarkable, non-smoker, obviously, and non-alcoholic, but that really is not the rule anymore. Many young ladies do occasionally smoke and drink. Pre-gestational body weight was a recent 55 kg and a BMI of 22.6 kilogram. Uh, and thanks to her, she was hardly uh, having any uh, appreciable height, not the ideal height, short lady, 156 centimeter. So an OGTT with 75 gram of glucose was performed at 24 weeks of gestational age when she weighed 62 kg and had a BMI of 25.5 kg per meter square. So this was a, uh, till now she had gained the weight in ideal manner. And at the OGT, the fasting serum sugar was 99 milligram per deciliter with one and two hour glycemia at 137 milligram and 118 milligram per deciliter respectively. So we applied the criteria of International Association of Diabetes in Pregnancy Study Group and uh, made a diagnosis of GDM as a fasting sugar. Any single uh, reading uh, out of the three abnormal reading is perceived as evidence of GDM. And the patient received instruction in self-monitoring of blood glucose in our clinic, was given nutritional and lifestyle recommendations, and started performing six-point daily blood glucose profiles. A week later, Fasting and preprandial capillary blood glucose levels were found to be below 90 mg per deciliter on most days, with only one two-hour postprandial reading slightly exceeding 120 mg and um, being read at 124 mg per deciliter. Now, beyond this slide, I am going to present an experience that I have had a novel experience, with, which is an actual case from my practice. And... Uh, this are just a quick look at the glycemic targets in pregnancy. Both AD and DIPSI concur when it comes to two-hour targets, but then ADA has also a one-hour insertion of less than or equal to 140 milligram per deciliter. And then she flatly refused insulin initiation. She was explained the benefits of replacing 15 gram of her rice batter or wheat tata intake twice per day by raw or uh, that is green jackfruit tata which is available online. And after three weeks of additional regular use of green jackfruit data uh, brand 365, 
these were her readings. A seven point. We, in fact, this time we requested for a seven point SMBG. You can see everything hale and hearty, and no early morning hypoglycemia. Now I'll proceed to the next case. A 24-year-old vegetarian primary gravida is diagnosed to have GDM during the 26th week of gestation. She is sedentary by nature. Height 160 centimeter, uh, weight huge 90 kg, giving her a BMI of 35.2. She had done fasting sugar at home, which was 84. But we, when she presented to us in the clinic, we uh, followed the Dipsy challenge and the, her readings two hours after 75 gram glucose in non-fasting state was 181 milligram. And uh, that's how we made a diagnosis of GDM. And now we are all confronted with that million dollar question. What advice do we give her regarding diet and exercise? Madam has very, very elegantly covered most of this, but still I need to touch some of these points when we are concentrating on GDM. So there is a quintet management model described in the net and I have acknowledged the source 2015 article which say then it's still um, uh, in the same uh, way we pursue this ladies diet exercise maternal education uh, and therapies mostly insulin in our country and fetal health evaluation is also of equal importance so medical nutrition therapy happens to be the cornerstone of management of gdm because it ensures adequate nutrition ensures adequate weight gain prevents ketosis, prevents uh, postprandial spikes and thereby glycemic variability and exercise insulin and a debatable role of oral anti-diabetic agents and psychosocial assessment and counseling form the other important options and arms available of the management strategy. So something about GDM diet. Diet uh, is usually recommended at 30 kilocalorie per kilogram in normal weight ladies, 24 kilocalorie per kilogram for overweight women, and 12 kilo, uh, kilocalorie per kilogram for mor morbidly obese women. The uh, case number two that we saw, she had a BMI of 35.2. She would probably attract this low calorie diet. And diet should contain, in general, carbohydrate 50 to 55 percent while avoiding simple sugars, protein 20 percent at uh, the rate of 1.1 gram per kilogram ideal body weight. So I have just inserted the ideal body weight formula in for women at the bottom. Fat should contribute not more than 25 to 30 percent of the lady's diet. And fiber is always a welcome uh, addition, 20 to 40 grams per day. Frequent small meals. This has al already been alluded to by one Dr. Benny Madam. But uh, in GDM, this really, again, uh, is a very appealing strategy. Frequent small meal regimens, two to three hourly to avoid hypoglycemia and minimize glycemic variability. Bedtime snacking to prevent ketosis overnight is also important to be followed. And adequate hydration, at least two liters of water per day while avoiding fresh food juices filtered fruit juice. Now, something about micronutrients during hyperglycemia and pregnancy. And this will cover any first time notice hyperglycemia, irrespective of the trimester. And they, they, the recommendation remains similar for women with and without diabetes. So folate at 570 micrograms per day, calcium 1000 milligram per day, iron 27 milligram per day, vitamin B12 2.7 five micrograms per day. And these are uh, sourced from ICMR NIN 2020 document. And Endocrine Society of India uh, recommends supplementation of vitamin D at a dose of 1000 in international units per day in pregnant women after 12 weeks of pregnancy. And sometimes, and I would also like to, um, you know, request our honorable moderator and chairperson at the end, uh, what is the take? We sometimes recommend from day one, the moment we come to know that the lady has conceived, uh, we do recommend a supplement of uh, vitamin D in minimum doses per day. Something regarding artificial sweeteners during hyperglycemia and pregnancy. So sucralose, stevia and aspartame are considered safe for limited consumption during HIV. 
they cannot be taken in very large quantities. Stevia is considered a natural non-caloric sweetener. Sucralose is considered non-nutritive sweetener. A few or no calories. And aspartame is a nutritive sweetener which adds some calories but far, far less than sugar. And something about physical activity, though there has been a full session on this, but I would still allude to this few lines. Unless contraindicated, physical activity should be included in a pregnant woman's daily regimen, whether she is a, uh, established diabetic, whether or not she develops DDM, still every pregnant woman should exercise and break up extended periods of sedentariness. And regular moderate intensity physical activity like walking can help to reduce glucose levels in patients with DDM. And um, our own um, Anjana Madam, uh, the proud daughter of Honorable um, Professor V. Mohan Sir, my mentor, has, uh, in, way back in 2016 came out with this important, uh, you know, important, important observation for all of us that rec recreational walking was associated with improved neonatal outcomes in Indian women with GDM and this was published in an important journal, Index Journal Diabetes Research and Clinical Practice. It comes from the idea way back in 2016. Cardiovascular, cardiovascular training with weight bearing limited to the upper body and uh, this is uh, the reason behind this um, specific recommendation is to avoid mechanical stress on the abdominal lead. So, uh, slide dedicated to ideal weight gain during hyperglycemia and pregnancy. So, if the lady is underweight, let's say less than 18 BMI, she can uh, be allowed to gain up to 13.5 kg, 11 to 13.5 kg. And like the lady we I referred to in case number two, morbidly obese, more than 35 BMI, her weight gain uh, preferably should be limited to less than 3.5 kg through the, throughout the nine months of gestation. And then you can uh, look at the ideal body weight situation, 18 to 24 BMI. And such ladies can be allowed to gain up anywhere from 8 to 11 kg of body weight during the nine months of gestation. Now I'll come to the third and the last case of my presentation. Mrs. N, a 32-year-old second gravida, is found to have GDM at 27 weeks of gestation. Her first pregnancy was uneventful, healthy. She was advised lifestyle and diet changes and she meticulously adhered to all these instructions. And after two weeks, her blood sugars were as follows. Fasting sugar was 96 mg per deciliter, two-hour post-breakfast. Okay. Uh, was 159 milligram per deciliter. So, uh, do these figures satisfy us? Is her glycemic control adequate? And uh, I, we all agree it is not. So, what should be the next line of treatment we should be offering her? That would be insulin in initiation in our country. So, in a slide dedicated to insulin therapy. A lot has been spoken by my very, very uh, learned uh, you know, colleague, Dr. Benny Madam. So insulin therapy has to be individualized that we need to remember. Many women with GDM have uh, significant postprandial glucose elevations following just one of their meals. So such ladies will do well with a single dose of rapid acting analog or regular human insulin given before that meal. And few GDM ladies may require basal plus, that is one basal plus one prandial dose of insulin or basal bolus that, uh, that will be, might be one uh, basal and two or three prandial uh, doses insulin as warranted by their SMBG readings. And uh, a, a, a small reference to pre-mixed based regimens, which uh, though may sound very convenient to use, but they do not offer any flexibility in terms of titrating the individual components of the formulation, the premix formulation, even including the co-formulation of rhizodic iodecast. So they are not of much favor. We normally stick to in GDM, uh, first look at the postprandials, pick up the uh, meal with the highest postprandial excursion, address that, and then if then the repeat SMBG, uh, demand, then we go on adding insulin. So the basal if fastings are high. Naturally, we will be settling for a basal analog at that time. The last slide. What about status of oral hypoglycemic agents in hyperglycemia in pregnancy? 
So due to efficacy and safety concerns, though metformin enjoys category B uh, classification, it, it but it does cross placenta. Comparatively, gliburide, that is glibenclamide, crosses, uh, crosses less in amount, but then it is classified as category C. These are all B and C are uh, pointers to the potential hazards of consuming such medicines. And uh, metformin is allowed by ADA and uh, even DIPSI. Uh, if the lady has been on metformin, for example, uh, non-diabetic uh, lady for a gynecological indication like PCOS, if the lady has been on metformin, the standard approach is to allow metformin for first four months of gestation and then ease it, ease it out. And if the lady insists, she still stands the chance of requiring support of additional insulin therapy. But the official dictum is that due to efficacy and safety concerns, the AD and DIPC do not recommend oral antihypoglycemic agents for GDM or pre-existing pre type 2 diabetes. Now, the first case, one sentence regarding the first case, um, it was just um, a, a relative, sort of a relative, very close family friend who trusted me. And uh, this uh, particular product, that green jackfruit atta, uh, my wife has been using since ages. Her glycemia has come under very good control. Medicines have gone down. So I was enthused to offer that GDM lady who was not open to taking insulin at all with that one single postprandial escalation. So I uh, think it has been an individual um, experience and I wanted to humbly share with all of you. And here I end my presentation. There are no major takeaways except that pursue GDM vigorously. Screen ladies at the first contact. That's very important. Uh, even if the lady lands up in our obstetrician gynecologist's place or in, a, in her family doctor's place or in our clinic, as soon as missed periods or pregnancy is confirmed, the first contact is the ideal time to screen that lady for her sugar levels. Sometimes we take help of HB1C also in uh, when the, whenever there is a strong family history, for example, and a strong suspicion of uh, uh, Madam referred to early uh, trimester, the first trimester detection of hyperglycemia in pregnancy. In such cases, in let's say within first eight weeks, I would or first 12 weeks, I would also tend to additionally do HB1C and perhaps that might uh, help us in pointing out to a missed pre-existing uh, diabetes story. So screen, pursue, and make sure you vigorously uh, follow these ladies. I have to speak only about medical management. So beyond that, normally we screen prior to discharge. Keep, keep them, keep such ladies for, convince them to stay in the hospital with the help of our obstetricians for two days more, a day or two and pursue their sugars postpartum and um, request them to or follow them up and make sure they uh, undergo a GTT again at six weeks. And uh, yes, sir, we are then, going we are going to our detailed session for postpartum. Yeah, so I'm ending here. Thank you very much for all your uh, patience and thank you for giving me this opportunity.